If you want to perform statistical analysis or implement data analytical tasks, R programming should be a go-to language. Understanding the importance of R language, we are bringing you this comprehensive tutorial on R programming for beginners. In this tutorial, we shall start off by working with data types and variables in R. Then we shall work with different data structures in R, such as vector, list, metrics, and data frame. Going ahead, we shall work with flow control statements in R, following which we shall work with deployer library for performing data manipulation operations. Finally, we shall work with ggplot2 library for data visualization. Now, before we start off with the session, I request you guys to please like the video and also subscribe to our channel. On that note, let's dive into R programming. So folks, we have opened up R Studio and this is how the console of R Studio looks like. So we've got four panes over here. So this, what you see is known as the script window. So let's say if you're writing a really, really long script. So this is where you'll write all of your code. So as you see, whatever code you have, you will type it out over here. So let's say if you want to write a thousand line code or even a 10,000 line code. And if it's a really long program, you can have all of that written over here and you can just save this particular script. Now down over here, this, what you see is the console window. And this is where you execute all of your R codes. And this, what you see, this is known as the environment window. And this over here, if you want to, let's say, import some data sets, you can go ahead and import them over here. And also you can see the history of all of the commands that you've run over here. Then at the bottom, we've got this pane, which would help us to visualize some plots and also whatever files you have, you can look at all of those files over here. Similarly, let's say if you want to install some packages, you can also go ahead and do that. So you see this install button over here. You just need to click on this. So whatever package it is. So we have a package called as deployer and this package is normally used for data manipulation. So let's say if I want to install this library or package into this R studio, all I need to do is type it out over here. And when I click on install, the package would be installed into R studio. So as simple as that. So this, what you see is R studio. Now we will go ahead and write our first command. So whatever programming language you are working with, normally if you want to print something out onto the screen, well, we have this print statement. So just write down print. So this, what you see is the console window. Let me also maximize this for you guys. Write down print, put in these braces over here and inside that put in double quotes. Now, what we want to do is I'd want to print something out onto the screen. So for that purpose, I'll just write down this as my first R program and I'll hit enter. And as you see, I've been able to execute the first line of code onto the console. So folks, you have taken the first step to learn R programming. So now that we have printed the first line onto our studio, our next step would be to work with data. So if you are working with data, we'd have to store the data somewhere, isn't it? And this is where variables come in. So let me just add in a comment over here as variable. So what exactly is this variable? As I've told you, if you want to store something, that is when you will use this variable. So let's understand how we are supposed to store data. Now I will create a variable called as var1 and inside this I will store a number. So let's say I have a number called as 1, 2, 3 and I'd want to store this somewhere. So what I've done is I have created this variable called as var1 and I have this value and I'm storing this into this variable var1. Now. Let me just print out var1 for you guys. And as you see, I have been able to store this value of 1, 2, 3 inside this variable whose name is var1. Now, you'd have to remember that a variable is a temporary storage space. Now, what exactly is a temporary storage space? Well, if you store a value inside a variable, you can go ahead and change that value after some time. 
So right now the value which is stored in var1 is 1, 2, 3. Now what I'd want to do is I'd want to change this value. So inside var1 now I will store 4, 5, 6 and let me print out var1 for you guys. And as you see the value of var1 has been changed to 4, 5, 6 from 1, 2, 3. Similarly, I'll go ahead and store some other value instead of 4, 5, 6. Let me go ahead and store 7, 8, 9 right now. Now also let me print out var1 and as you see, the value has been successfully changed. So with the help of a variable, we can store a certain value and also that value can be changed whenever we want. So this is a simple introduction to variables. Now, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and clear out my screen. So I've just pressed Ctrl L and when I press Ctrl L, I'll be able to clear my screen over here. Now, after this, whenever we are working with data, it's not necessary that data is present only in numeric format, right? So now, apart from numeric format, we can also have data which is present in the text format. So let's see here if I write down my name, which is Bharani, this is in text format or string format. Similarly, our data can also, if it's numeric, it can also have decimal values. So let's say if I have something called as 67.123, it can also have data like this. And when it comes to computers, you are basically dealing with binary values, isn't it? And when we say binary values, what is that? So binary values are basically 0, 1, true, false, yes, no. And for that, we have these binary values. So when you type in true, that is another data type. Similarly, when you have false, this is again a new data type. Now, apart from this, uh, probably in your uh, primary school or in your secondary school, you would have learned about complex numbers. So if I write something like 3 plus 10 i, let me remove the capital i, let me make it small i. So here 3 is the real part and 10 is the imaginary part. And when you combine a real part and an imaginary part together, what you're basically getting is a complex number. So what we'll do is we'll store all of these different types of data in our variables and check their types. So we have already worked with the numeric data type. Now I'd want to go ahead and store a string type data into my variable. So here again, I'll have a var1 and inside var1, I'll store a value. Let me call it as help me. And now let me check the type of it. So I have a method called as class and inside this class, I will pass in var1. And as you see, this is character. So the value of or basically the data type which I'm storing in this variable is character. Now, after some time since a variable is a temporary storage space, I can change the value which is present in this variable. So now inside var1, I will go ahead and store false. Now. Let me check the type of this. So class, I'll pass in var1 and as you see, this is logical. So true and false are logical data types. And also you'd have to remember that when we are working with true and false. So here, all of your characters are in capital. That is when R or R studio will recognize that this you are actually referring to the logical false or logical true. Now, similarly, Let's say if I actually given where one is equal to false, let me make it small over here. You see that we get an error because our studio does not recognize a false. So if you are working with logical values, it has to be capital false or capital true. And you also have a short form for that. Now coders are generally lazy because we do not want to type a lot of code. So let's say if I do not want to type in false entirely, I can just put in a capital F over here. And as you see, I have stored the value. Now, when I print out var1, you will see that I have successfully stored false. Similarly, let's say if I do want to store the value of true, I can just type in var1 is equal to true. Or on the other hand, I can also have var1 is equal to t. And both of them basically signify the same thing. Now let me clear the screen again and going ahead, 
will also store the complex type value. So where one is equal to, let me write in five plus 10 I. Now let me print out var one over here and let me check the class of this class of var one. And you would see that this is a complex data type. So the important point to note over here is the type of variable or class of variable is dependent on the type of data you're storing into it. So let's say if you're storing a numeric value into a variable, the type of variable will be numeric. Similarly, if you're storing a logical value into a variable, the class or type of variable will be logical. So this is some basic intro into variables and data types in R programming. Now, going ahead, we'll also work with operators. So let me write in another comment over here, operators. Now, when it comes to operators, as the name states, you'll be able to perform simple operations. So when I say simple operations, you'll be able to perform arithmetic operations, logical operations and relational operations. So let's start off with arithmetic operations here. Again, hashtag arithmetic operators. So this hashtag, which you see, that is basically a comment. So comments are basically lines which are not executed by your compiler. So you can just consider this to be as a simple line or a header which would help you know the coders to understand what we are writing over here or what the code is about. So let's go ahead to arithmetic operators. Now arithmetic operator would help us to perform simple operations such as addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. For that purpose, I will have two variables over here. Let me have my first variable as a1 and inside a1, I'll store the value 35. Then I'll have another value called as b1 and in b1, I'll have the value 67. So these are the two values which I have in these two variables. Now I'll perform simple operations. So let's say if I have a1 plus b1, the result comes up to be 102 because 35 plus 67 is equal to 102. Now, similarly, if I write down over here, a1 minus b1, I have minus 32 because 35 minus 67 is equal to minus 32. Now, instead of a1 minus b1, let's say if I put in b1 minus a1 over here, I get 32 because 67 minus 35 is equal to 32. So when you are performing subtraction, the ordering obviously matters. And this is something which you would have definitely learned in primary school. So now that we have performed addition, subtraction, we've got division and multiplication left. So let's also perform multiplication. So here I'll have a1 star b1. And when I multiply a1 with b1, I get a value of 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, isn't this quite an interesting number? So similarly, let's say if I want to divide these two values, let me just type in a1 forward slash b1, and I'll get this particular value. Similarly, instead of a1 divided by b1, if I have b1 divided by a1, I'll have the value of 1.91. So these are some basic arithmetic operators. And now we'll go ahead and work with relational operators. Again, let me write down a comment over here, relational operators. Now, again, I'll have two more variables over here. So this time, let's say I have a2 and in a2, I'll have the value 12. I'll have b2 and in b2, I'll have the value 23. Now, if I want to find out the relationship between these two variables, such as, if one variable is lesser than the other variable or the value in one variable is lesser than the other variable or if the values are different or if the values are same. So if you don't want to understand all of these relationships, we have simple relational operators. Now, if I just put in a2 is less than b2 over here, I get a true result because 12 is obviously less than 23. Similarly, if I have a2 is greater than b2, I have a false over here because 12 is not greater than 23. After this, I'll have something called as the double equal to operator a2 double equal to b2. 
Again, I get a false. So here I'm checking if the value which is present in A2 is equal to the value which is present in B2 and I get a false. And now I'll have one more operator which is the not equal to operator. So let me also use that A2 is not equal to B2. I get a true result because obviously 12 is not equal to 23. And these are some of the relational operators. And now we'll look at something called as an assignment operator. So let me write in the comment over here, assignment operator. Now we have already looked at the double equal to operator. Now when it comes to the assignment operator, in assignment operator we'll have only one equal to symbol. So what is the difference between this? Well, if I'd want to assign a particular value to something, that is when I'll use an assignment operator. So we have already seen an example of this. So let's say if I want to store something in, let's call this var3. And if I want to store the value of 100 in var3, I can use this equal to symbol. Now, the assignment operator can also be of a different form. Instead of using the equal to symbol, what I can do is I can also have something like this. I can give in this less than symbol and then I can put in a hyphen over here. Now inside var3, let's say if I store the value 200. Now let me also print out var3 for you guys. And as you see, so this also works as the assignment operator. So I have been able to successfully store the value of 200 inside this variable var3. Going ahead, I also have another form of this. So first, let's say if I want to give in a value, I'll give in 300 and I want to store 300 inside a variable. So I'll have 300. Now it's basically reverse. First you give in the hyphen, then you give in the greater than symbol and you're storing it into var3. Now let me print out var3 for you folks and you see that the value of 300 is stored in this variable. So these are the different types of assignment operators we have and with the help of assignment operators we can store a value into a variable. Going ahead, we'll work with logical operators. I'll put in a comment for this as well, logical operators. And with the help of logical operators, we can try to basically make a decision. And that decision is based upon these two operators. So we have something called as the AND operator and the OR operator. So this is the AND operator, this is the OR operator. Now you'd have to remember that the AND operator gives you a true result when both of the operands are true. And the OR operator gives you a true result when either of the operand is true. Now, if this might sound a bit confusing, let's have an example on the scene. So here, what I'll do is I'll have two variables. Let me have var5 over here. Inside var5, I will store true. Then I will have var6 and inside var6, I will have false. Now, let's start off by working with the AND operator. So I'll have var5 and var6. I'll get a false result because true and false is equal to false. Similarly, when I have var6 and var5, I also get a false result. Now, when I have var5 and var5, this is the only case where I get a true result because both of the operands, I have the true value stored. And now let's go ahead with the OR operator. And OR operator is given by this particular symbol. So again, we'll just take only these two variables, var5 and var6. So if I write down var5 or var6, I get a true result because true or false is equal to true. Similarly, var6 or var5, again I get a true result because false or true is also a true. The only case where I'll get a false is var6 or var6. So when I have false in both of the operands, this is the only case where I'll be getting a false result. So these are the two logical operators. And now we have also covered the logical operators. 
Now we will dive into something called as data structures in R. So this is quite interesting. So till now, whenever we had to store data, we've been using something called as a variable. And let me tell you a simple problem with a variable. So with a variable, you can only store one value at a time. But what if I'd want to store multiple values? So uh, let's say you go to a supermarket and uh, you want to take multiple things. Now, you can't keep removing whatever you store into the cart, isn't it? So let's say you go ahead and first you add maybe you take a chocolate bar, you put it into the cart. Now you pass ahead and you actually see a chips packet. So if you're working with a variable, you'd have to remove the chocolate and you'd have to replace that chocolate with a chips packet. But what if I want to take a chocolate bar, a chips packet, a milk packet, and uh, probably even a uh, one kg of rice. If I'd want to store all of these into the cart, I would need something called as data structures. And with the help of these data structures, I can store multiple values at the same time. And are these the simplest data structure is known as a vector. So here, I'll add this comment called as a vector. So a vector is a homogeneous data structure. And when I say homogeneous data structure, you can store elements of the same type. You can consider this to be a bit analogous to arrays in other programming languages. So if you work with maybe C, C++ or Java, you would have known about this concept called as arrays. So in arrays, what you're doing is you're storing multiple elements of the same type. Now here, let me go ahead and create a vector. I'll call this as V1. And to create a vector, I will be using this C operator. C stands for combine operator. And after this, I'll give in these parentheses and inside the parentheses. Now let's say I would want a chips packet. After that, I would want a milk packet and I would also need one kg of rice. Let me change the name over here and let me call this my cart. Now let me print out my cart for you guys. So what I've done is I have created a vector and in this vector I have stored chips, milk and rice. Now once I've added these items into the cart, let's say if I'd want to individually extract these items, I would have something known as indexing. So let's say if I'd want to extract chips out of this cart, so we'd have to understand the index value. So this is present at index number one, milk is present at index number two, and rice is present at index number three. So here I'll just write down my cart, then I'll give in parenthesis. So here I'm giving square braces. And inside the square braces, this is present at index number one. So if I'd want to extract the chips packet out of this cart, I'll give in one. And you see that I've been able to extract chips. Similarly, let's say if I'd want to extract a milk packet out of this, I'll change this value. I'll keep it to two. And you see that I've been able to extract a milk packet. Similarly, if I'd want to extract the rice packet, I will give in three. And you see that I've extracted rice. Now, let's say if I'd want to omit something out of this. So from this card, if I want only the milk packet and the rice packet, what I can do is I'll have my cart and I am removing chips. Since I'm removing chips, I'll have minus one, which would basically mean that I am removing the item which is present at index number one. So when I do this, you would see that from my cart, I am extracting only the milk packet and the rice packet. Similarly, let's say if I would want only the chips packet and the rice packet, what I can do is I can just have my cart, I'll put in minus two over here, I have chips and rice. Now, after this, let's say if I'd want, um, let's say chips and milk, I can just put in minus three over here and I've extracted chips and milk. So this is how we can create a vector and extract some values out of this vector. Now, I've told you an important thing before starting vectors, which was a vector is a homogeneous data structure. So that is why what I've done is in the my cart vector, I've stored elements of the same type. Now let me go ahead and create something else. So let's say 
I'll have another vector called as my numbers and inside my numbers I'll just have some random numbers over here I'll have 23 34 45 and 56 now let me print out my numbers for you guys and you see that I have all of these values so again all of these so let me also print out my card for you guys so I have my numbers in my card and let me show you the class of both of them class of my numbers you would see that this is a numeric vector and similarly I'll have class of my card you will see that this is a character vector now let me do something interesting so let's say if I want to mix these two things so I'll call this my cart numbers and here let's say I have chips after chips let's say I given 30 then I write down milk and after I write down milk I'll given the value 40 now I hit enter you see that I've been able to execute this so how is this actually a homogeneous data structure if I'm able to store a character type value and a numeric type value at the same time well let me show you the magic now let me check the class of this class of my cart numbers you will see that this is of character type so what has happened over here is the numeric values which you have passed inside this vector they have been coerced into numeric into actually character type so in your final let me print out the final vector and you will see that the values of 30 and 40 which I had passed in as numeric they have been coerced into character and that is why the class of the vector which I've created is actually a character vector now similarly what I want to do is let me also pass in some logical values over here let me call this v1 random and inside this I'll have numbers 12 34 and after this I'll have a true value and a false value now true and false are logical type values 12 and 34 are numeric type values so what do you think would be the final type of this vector so let's go ahead and check this out I'll have class inside class I will pass in v1 random and you see that this is numeric now why is this numeric well let's look at the result v1 random and here you see that the values are 12 34 1 and 0 which means that the true and false values have been coerced into numeric type so that is why your final type of the vector is actually numeric over here now what I'd want to do is I'd want to mix the character type the numeric type and the logical type into the same vector so let me call this v1 total chaos is equal to c of i'll have 12 let me write down um, chaos over here and i'll have true now all right so i've made a mistake over here let me keep this in capitals now let me print out v1 total chaos for you guys you would see that so here we have a string type value a numeric type value and a logical type value now the numeric type value has been converted into string the logical type value has also been converted to string now why has this happened because the highest precedence is of string then we have numeric then we have logical so let's say if you have elements of different data types in a same vector the highest precedence would be of character then follows numeric then follows logical so this is why you will see that a vector is always homogeneous irrespective of what elements you pass in the final elements would be of the same type and that is why we call a vector as a homogeneous data structure 
So I hope this is quite simple to you guys and you have understood this properly. Now what I'd want to do is I'll introduce you folks to the next data structure which is a list. Again let me have a comment over here I'll write down list. Let's start by understanding the difference between a vector and a list. So when it came to a vector if you are adding elements of different types the final elements would be of the same type. But let's say if I want the individual elements to maintain their identity, that is, if I have a numeric value, a logical value and a string value, I want the numeric to stay as numeric, the string to stay as string and the final logical value to stay as logical. We have something called as a list and your list is a heterogeneous data structure. A heterogeneous data structure basically means that you can store elements of different types and these elements of different types will have their identity maintained. Now, let us go ahead and create a list. So let's call this my cart list. And if we are supposed to create a list, I have a method called as list in R. So let me just use this list and inside this, what I'll have is, I'll have chips. Let's say the cost of the chips packet is 20 and let's say if the billing has been done, I will have a true value over here. Now let me hit enter and let me print out my cart list for you guys and you will see that this is how your result looks like and also the individual identities maintain. Chips obviously stay as a string because it has the highest precedence. 20 is numeric, stays as numeric, true is logical, stays as logical. Now, if you guys still don't believe me, let me really show it to you guys. So I'll have class. Inside class, I will pass in my cart list. And here I'll have one, one. You will see that this is a character. So one, one over here, this indicates the first element, which is chips. Then I'll have one, two. Now this is actually two, one over here. Let me change it. This is compartment two, element one. This is numeric. Then finally, I will have three, one, and you will see that this is logical. So chips stays as character, 20 stays as numeric, and true stays as logical. Now let me make something complicated over here. Let me call this my complicated list. Again, if I'm supposed to create a list, I'll have list over here. Inside this, let me have a vector over here. This is a numeric vector. I'll pass in the values one, two, three. Then I'll have a character vector inside this. I will pass in the values A, B and C. Then I will have a logical vector inside this. I'll have values true and false. So I have my complicated list. Let me print out my complicated list for you guys. So here, as you see, I have three compartments and in those three compartments, I have individual elements. The first compartment is for my numeric array. Second compartment is for my character array. Third compartment is for my logical array. Again, let me go ahead and check the data type of these individual values. So my complicated list before this, let me put in class. Let me have this. Let me get this copied over here. I'll get it pasted. So my complicated list. So one and let me just check the first element. You will see that this is a numeric. Similarly, let's say if I have this as Two one, this is character and when I have three one, this is logical. And now what I do want to do is let me print out my complicated list. So now from this, let's say if I would want to extract individual elements, let's see how can we do that. So from this entire list, let's say if I would want to extract this particular element, which is false. So here this is present at compartment number three and the index is two. So here, let me just write down my complicated list. I'll have the compartment, which is three. Now let's say if I just given the compartment number, I'll have true and false. 
Now, after this, I'll have another parenthesis and inside the parenthesis, I'll give in an index value. So if I give in two, it should mean that from the compartment number three, I am extracting this false value. Similarly, let's say if I'd want to extract this number two from this entire list. So what I'll do is I'll have my complicated list compartment as one and it has presented index number two and I have extracted this. So this is how we can extract individual elements from a complicated list. Now going ahead, we'll work with matrices. So let me just add in a comment over here. I'll write down matrices and matrices are two dimensional data structures. So till now we've been working with vectors and lists. So when it came to vectors and lists, these are linear data structures. That is, these are present in a single plane. Now, if I'd want values to be stored in, let's say more than one dimension, I have something called as a matrix and your matrix is obviously present in a two dimensional space. And when I say a two dimensional space, you will have rows and columns over here. So let me just go ahead and create my first matrix. I'll call this as my matrix is equal to, and if I want to create a matrix, I have this method called as matrix and inside this, let me pass in data. So let's say I have the value starting from one going on till six. Now I'll hit enter and let me print out my matrix for you guys. So here you will see that I have indices over here on the left hand side and also index on the top, which would indicate that I have rows as well as a column. And by default, you will only have one column if you're creating a matrix. So if I want to change that, so in this particular command, what I'd want to do is I have an attribute called as n row. So here I have six elements. So for these six elements, let's say I can arrange them in either one row, two rows or three rows or six rows. So let's say if I want two rows for this, I'll set n row is equal to two. I'll hit enter and let me print out my matrix for you guys. And here, as you see, I have created this matrix. And in the first row, I have the elements one, three, five. In the second row, I have the elements two, four, six. But let's say in the first row itself, now I have these numbers starting from one going on till six and they are arranged in a sequential order. But in the matrix, what is happening is these elements are arranged column wise. So one, two, first column, three, four, second column, five, six, third column. Here in the same command, what I'll do is I have another attribute called as by row and I'll set by row is equal to true. Now, when I print out my matrix over here, you shall see that these numbers have been arranged row wise. So one, two, three is in the first row, four, five, six is in the second row. And this my friends is how you create a matrix. Now, once we have this matrix, let me also show you how to extract elements from this. So let's say if I'd want to extract this particular element, which is five. So here you see these index values. So this is present at row number two and column number two. So I'll have my matrix inside parenthesis. I'll just write down two comma two and you shall see that I have extracted five from this entire matrix. Similarly, if I'd want to extract this number three, so this is present at row number one, column number three. So I'll have one, three over here, and you shall see that I've extracted this value as well. Going ahead, we'll work with data frames. So a data frame is again a multidimensional data structure. And when it comes to data frames, you can store elements of different types as well. Now we had talked about that cart, isn't it? Where let's say if I'd want three different types of things, so uh, the first quantity would indicate the name of the item. The second type would indicate the cost of the item and the third would basically indicate the quantity of the item. So for that, let me create three vectors over here. I'll have one vector called as item name inside item name. I'll have chips, then I'll have milk and then I'll have rice. Going ahead, I'll have item cost. 
So chips, let's say it costs 20 rupees. Then I have milk, which would let's say cost 25 rupees. Then I have rice, which would let's say cost 75 rupees. And then I have quantity. So item quantity is equal to C. Chips, let's say I take three packets. Milk, I take five packets. And um, let's say rice, I take one packet. So I have these three set. Now, what I want is I'd want to create something called as a data frame. So here I shall write down data dot frame. And with the help of this, I can sort of create a table like structure where I'll have three different columns indicating these three different items. So here I'll just write down name is equal to item name then i'll have cost here i'll write down item cost then i'll have quantity inside this i'll just pass in item quantity now let me store this in supermarket and let me print out supermarket for you guys so what i've done is i have created a data structure or basically a data frame and in this data frame I have three columns name cost and quantity so in this column name I have chips milk and rice cost is 20 25 and 75 quantity is 3 5 and 1 so here you will see that so in this the data type is same for this particular column for this particular column data type is same for this particular column data type is same but if I look at a particular row, then it's not necessary that the data type shall be same. So this is how you can work with a data frame. Now let's say if I'd want to extract individual records from this. So let's say if I'd want to extract only the name of the item from this data frame. So what I can do is I can give in the name of the data frame, which is supermarket. Then I can use the dollar symbol and then select the column. Supermarket dollar name and you see that I have extracted chips, milk and rice. Similarly, if I'd want to extract cost, I'll write down supermarket dollar cost and I've extracted 20, 25 and 75. Then let's say if I'd want quantity, I'll have supermarket dollar quantity and I've extracted three, five and one. So folks, this is how we can create a data frame and also extract individual columns from this. So we have properly learned the fundamentals in our programming. Now we will head into flow control statements. So in flow control statements, we have looping statements and decision making statements. We'll start off with decision making statements. Now, whenever you'd have to make a decision, you probably choose. So it's either this or that. And that this and that is made on the basis of a condition. So let's say if this happens, then you do something else you do something else so for that we have something called as if statement in our programming language so what i'll do is i'll go ahead and create a vector right now let me create a vector called as vec3 and inside this what i'll do is i'll store some values so let me store 10 20 30 40 and 50 inside this vector named as vec Three, and let me print it out for you guys so I have created this vector 3 now what I would want to do is if I would want to check if the value which is present at index number 1 is equal to 10 and if the value is actually equal to 10 I would want to change it to 100 so for that purpose let me go ahead and write the if syntax let me delete this thing from the script window over here and I'll write the if syntax. I'll write down if inside these braces, I'll give in the condition. So in the condition, I'll check if vec3 and the index value would be 1. So if at index number 1, the value is equal to 10, what I'd want to do is I'd want to change that value to be equal to 100. So this condition is obviously true right now. So if you check the element which is presented index number one, that is equal to 10. So this condition is evaluated to true. 
And since this condition is evaluated to true, we'll enter the body of this if statement and whatever is present inside the body of this if statement, we shall execute it. So let me go ahead and copy this entire thing and I shall paste it over here. Now let me go ahead and print out VEC3 again. So as you see, initially the value which was present at index number one, it was equal to 10. Now, after using this if statement, we have been able to change that value from 10 to 100. Now let's go ahead and look at some more examples of this. So here, let me again have VEC3 printed out for you guys. And these are all of the elements. And now I'd want to check if the value which is present at index number two, if that is equal to 30. So I'll write down if VEC3 and I'm checking the value which is present at index number two. So if VEC3 index number two is equal to 30, what I'd want to do is I'd want to go ahead and print out let's say index 2 is 30 let me go ahead and paste this over here and as you see we do not get anything over here and that is because this condition is false and whatever condition if it is evaluated to false inside the if condition then we will just skip out the body of the if statement since this is evaluated to false, I'll skip this entire body and nothing happens. Now, if I still want to evaluate something, so if I still want to print out something, even if the condition is false, what I can do is I shall have something called as the else statement. So again, let me have WIC3 over here. Again, I'll check the same condition. So what I'm doing is I'm checking if the element which is present at index number two, if that is equal to 30. If that is equal to 30, I'll print out this, but that is evaluating to false. Since that is evaluating to false, what I'll do is I'll have something called as the else statement. If this is false, go ahead and do something else. Print, what I'd want to print is index two is 20. Let me copy this entire thing and I shall paste it over here. Now, as you see, what has happened over here is we have checked this particular condition first. Now, after checking this condition, since this is false, I'll skip whatever is present inside the body of if statement. I'll directly go to the else statement and I will do or execute whatever is present inside the else statement. Since I have this print statement inside this else body, I'll go ahead and print out index two is 20. So if and else we have covered. Now what I want to do is I'll go ahead and take three numbers. So I'll have a number called as A, I'll store the value 10 inside that. I'll have a variable called as B, I'll store the value 20 inside that and I'll have a variable called as C and I'll store the value 30 inside this. And using the if else statements, I'd want to check which of these variables has the highest value. So first I'll write down if A is greater than B and A is greater than C. What I'd want to do is I would want to print out A is the greatest. On the other hand, if this is evaluated to false, I can give another condition. So to give another condition, I shall write down else if B is greater than A and B is greater than C. If this happens, I'd want to print out B is the greatest. And if this also evaluates to false, I'll just have another L statement. And inside this, I'll go ahead and print out C is the greatest. Now, let me go ahead, select this entire thing and let me drag this up a bit and I shall paste it over here. So now you see that I have 10 in A, 20 in B, 30 in C. And when I execute this entire piece of code over here, the first if statement, since this is false, I will not enter the body of this if statement. Then I use else if I'm checking this condition. This is also evaluating to false. 
And then finally, I have the last else statement. Since these two are false, I'll just directly head to this else statement and I will execute whatever is present inside this body. And inside the body of the final else statement, I have the print statement with the help of which I'm printing out C is the greatest. So this is all about if else statements. Now, what we shall do is we will go ahead and work with looping statements. So with the help of looping statements, we can repeat a particular task. Now, I'll have a variable called as i and inside this variable i, I'll store the value 1. Now, what I'd want to do is I'd want to add the number 1 each time to this value of i. So 1 plus 1 becomes 2, 2 plus 1 becomes 3, 3 plus 1 becomes 4 and 4 plus 1 becomes 5. Now, I don't have to manually do this. If I just put it inside a loop, I will just get those incremental values. Here, I have a looping statement called as while. And inside while, I'll give in the condition. I'd want this while loop to run as long as the value of i is less than or equal to 5. So as long as the value of i is less than or equal to 5, I would want to print out i. And what I'll do is inside the loop as well, I will keep on incrementing the value of i. Now let me select this entire thing and I shall paste it over here in the command window. And as you see over here with the help of this while loop, I have been able to print out 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Again, if you are still confused about what is happening over here, let me make this even more clear. So initially value of i is equal to 1 and inside the while loop, I shall check if i is less than or equal to 5. Currently value of i is 1. So is 1 less than or equal to 5? Yes, that is true. Since that is true, I'll enter this while loop and I'll print out i. So what is i? It is 1. So here I'm printing out 1. After printing out 1, I shall increment the value of i. i is equal to i plus 1. Now the value of i is equal to 2. Then I'll go back, I'll check this condition. So is 2 less than or equal to 5? Yes, that is true. Since that is true, I'll again enter this while body and I'll print out i which is equal to 2. And again after that, i is equal to i plus 1. Now i's value becomes 3. And this process goes on until this condition over here becomes false. And this is how you keep on iterating the values. Now let's say if I do want to have this list from 1 to 10 instead of 1 to 5, all I have to do is let me have this written properly over here. So I'll have while i is less than or equal to 10. And here, as you see, when I have executed this, I have all the numbers starting from 1 going on till 10. After the while loop, we have something called as the for loop. And the for loop is normally used to iterate over our data structures. And we have already worked with our data structures, which are vectors, lists, matrices, and data frames. So to give you guys an example, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and again create a vector. Let me call this as vecfor. In vecfor, I'll have again the values of 10, 20 and 30. Let me select this entire thing and I'll paste it over here. Let me also print this out. And when I print out vecfor, you shall see that I have the values 10, 20 and 30. Now, using the for loop, I would want to add 100 to each element inside this vector. Let me write out the for loop syntax for you guys. I'll write for and inside this I shall write for i in vec for all I have to do is print of i plus 100. Let me select this entire thing now and I shall paste it over here and as you guys see, so for each element over here, I've been able to add 100. So 10 plus 100 is 110, 20 plus 100 is 120, 30 plus 100 is 130. Now here, if you look at the syntax properly for i in vec for what is happening over here is i value starts from 10 and goes on till the end of this vector. So we are iterating over our vector. 
initially i's value is 10 then it becomes 20 then it becomes 30 and as we are iterating over here i am just adding so inside the body of the for loop so initially i is 10 10 plus 100 110 after that i's value becomes 20 20 plus 100 becomes 120 after that i's value becomes 30 30 plus 100 it is 130 so this is how you can work with for loops so now that we have worked with looping statements, it's time to work with functions. So with the help of a function, what you're basically doing is you are ensuring that you have a piece of code that you can invoke whenever you want. And to give you guys a simple example, all of you folks must have used a calculator, isn't it? And whenever you press the addition button or the plus symbol, what happens is two numbers are automatically added. So here what is happening is you have a piece of code and that piece of code has been embedded for that plus symbol or for that addition operation. And whenever you click on that plus symbol, two numbers or how many numbers are there, all of those numbers are added. Similarly, if you are looking at subtraction, whenever you click on that minus symbol, those two numbers are being subtracted. So we'll do something like that over here. So I'll go ahead and create a function so to create a function, you have this syntax called as function and in normally every function takes a parameter. So here inside these braces, what I am passing in is a parameter and here the parameter is X. Now what I'd want to do is whatever value I pass inside this function, I would want to add 10 more to that particular value. Now that I've written the function body over here, let me go ahead and store this in a new object or a new variable. I'll call this as add 10. Let me select this entire thing and I shall paste it over here. Now what I've done is I've just created the function body or I've defined a function. Now it's time to invoke the function or call the function. So to call the function, I'll write down add 10. And this what you see x is the parameter. So I'll pass in a parameter. So let's say I pass in phi over here. What is happening is so x is basically phi. Phi goes inside this function and I am printing out phi plus 10 which is equal to 15. Similarly instead of phi if I pass in 12 what I'll get is 22 over here because 12 plus 10 is 22. Again over here instead of 12 if i pass in 100 i'll have 110 because 100 plus 10 is thus it's also not necessary that you can have only one parameter inside a function you can have as many parameters as possible so if i'd want to add two values together so here i shall create a new method called as add let me write this properly add to num so Inside this, I'll just have two parameters. So this is the function body. Inside this parameters, I'm giving two parameters x and y. And what I'd want to print out or what I'd want to return is x plus y. I'll take this entire thing and I shall paste it over here. Now let me call add to num over here. And inside this, if I pass in 10 and 54, I'll get 64 because 10 plus 54 is equal to 64. Similarly, let me change these values over here. Now I'll have 31 and 90 and the final result becomes 121 because 90 plus 31 is equal to 121. So folks, this is how you can work with functions in our programming language. Now what we shall do is we will revisit data frames and work with some inbuilt functions on top of our data frame. Also, whenever you're working with R Studio, you have an inbuilt data set over here, which is known as the Iris data set. So let me show you guys that data frame. I'll use the view method inside view. I will pass in this really famous data frame known as Iris and I'll hit enter. And this is the IRS data frame. So if you want more information of this particular data frame, what you can do is just put in a question mark and then write in the name of the data frame, which is IRS. And here on the right hand side, you see this help section. You have all of the information related to this IRS data frame. So this is basically Edgar Anderson's IRS data. And this is the description. 
So this famous Fisher's or Anderson's iris data set gives the measurements in centimeters of the variable sepal length. So here you have sepal length, you have sepal width, petal length, petal width, and you have species. You basically have three different species of this iris flower and those three different species are Setusa, Vosicolor and Virginica. So this is basically a brief description of this data frame. Now that I know about this, if I don't want more information about this, what I can do is I have certain inbuilt methods and I can use those inbuilt methods. If I don't want to know the number of rows and number of columns which are present in this data frame, I have two methods called as nrow and ncall. So I'll use nrow. Inside this, I can just pass in the name of the object or the name of the data frame, which is iris. When I hit enter, I get 150, which basically means that there are 150 records or 150 rows in this iris data frame. Similarly, I can use the ncall method. Inside ncall, again, I shall pass in iris. So now I get five because there are five columns in this iris data frame. One, two, three, four, and five. So this was n row and n call. Now, if I want to get the number of rows and number of columns together, I have the dim method. Inside the dim method, I can just go ahead and pass in iris. And here you see that I have 150 and five. 150 basically denotes the number of records. Five basically denotes the number of columns. So this is set over here. After this, what I'd want to do is, let's say from this entire data frame, if I'd want to look at only the first six records of this iris data set, I have something called as the head method. So I shall write down head. Inside this, I'll just pass in iris. Now, let me maximize this. And as you see, for all of my columns, I only have the first six records. Similarly, instead of the first six records, let's say if I want to look at only the first three records, what I'll do is iris, I'll have this option of three. Now, when I hit enter, you shall see that I have only three records from this entire iris data frame. Similarly to the head method, we have the tail method. So if the head method gives you the top six records by default, the tail method would give you the bottom six records or the last six records by default. So now I shall write down tail and inside this, I will pass in the iris data frame. Let me just pass in iris. And when I hit enter, sure, have a look at the index numbers over here. So the index numbers start from 145 and go till 150 because these are the last six records which are present in this data frame. Now, instead of the last six records, if I want the last three records, I shall just put in three over here, tail iris three, and you will see that the index number starts from 148 and goes up till 150 because these are the last three records. Now, if I want to perform simple operations on this iris data frame, I have something called as the apply method. So using the apply method, so let's say, I have all of these numerical columns over here. Now, if I want to find out the minimum value across all of these numerical columns, what I can do is I can use the apply method. So let me show you how it's done. I shall write down apply and this sort of takes in three parameters. Your first parameter is basically vector or a list or a matrix or a data frame. So you basically pass in a data structure inside this. Here, I shall pass an iris. After that, you have the margin. So for margin, you can either give in one or two. So if you give the margin as one, it would mean that you're applying this across rows. If you're given the margin as two, that would mean that you are applying this function across columns. Now, what I'd want is I'd want the minimum value across all of this numerical columns. So since I want only the numerical columns, I would also have to make a certain change over here. So when I use iris, this shall also include the last column. So let me give in parenthesis over here. I don't want all the records. So here, this, the left side of the comma denotes all of the rows, the right side of the comma denotes all of the columns. So what I would want is, I would want all of the columns starting from column number one going on till column number four, but I do not want the last column. So from this iris data frame, I'm selecting all the rows 
and I am taking only the first four columns. Now it's time to give the margin. I'd want to apply this function across the columns. So here I'll given the margin value as two and I'd want to apply the minimum function across all of these columns. So I'll write down min. Now let me hit enter and this is the result as simple as that. So the minimum value which is present in the sepal length column is 4.3. Similarly, the minimum value which is present in the sepal width column is 2.0. Minimum value which is present in petal length column is 1.0 and the minimum value which is present in petal width column is 0.1. Now, if I want to find out the maximum value, all I have to do is just a little bit of change. Here, instead of min, I will keep it as max. And when I hit enter, you shall see that maximum value in sepal length column is 7.9. Maximum value in sepal width column is 4.4. In petal length column is 6.9. And in petal width column, it is 2.5. Now, instead of using the apply function, if I just directly want to find out the minimum value across a particular column, that can also be done. I can just use min. So this is the method inside the min method. I will just pass in this particular column. So if I want to pass in this particular column, that column is part of the iris data frame. So I shall write down iris dollar sepal length. And when I hit enter, you shall see that the value is 4.3. Now, similarly, if I want the minimum value of sepal width column, I'll have min iris dollar. I'll give sepal width and you shall see that the value is two. Now, if I want to tally it with the apply method, let me use this. So here you shall see that with the apply method as well, the minimum sepal length value comes out to be 4.3. The minimum sepal width value comes out to be 2.0. Now we shall work with the deployer package in R. So this library helps us to perform various types of data mining or data manipulation operations on top of our data. And now, We'll be performing all of our operations on top of the iris data set. So let me just go ahead and open this data set. So I'll write down view of iris and this is our very own iris data frame and we have already had a glance at this. Now it's time to load up the deploy library. And if we have to load any library, I would need to write down library and inside this I need to give in the name of it. So the name of the library is deployer and when I hit enter, we have successfully loaded this. Now, also at the start of the session, I've told you how to install a package or a library. So here you see this package button, just click on this, click on install and you need to type in the name of the library that you don't have to install. So here keep in mind that before you actually load a library, you would have to install it into your system. So first install it. Now, after you install it, you can just go ahead and use library. And inside that you can give in the name of the library and you are loading it. Now that we have done this, let's perform some data manipulation operations using this. So this deployer library has a variety of functions. Let me just write those functions down over here. So we have a function called as select. Then after that, we have a function called as filter. Going ahead, we have another function called as muted. So probably we'll be looking at these three different methods which are present in the deploy library. So the first method, which is select, helps you to select individual columns from this entire data frame. And now from this iris data frame, let's say if I'd want to select the sepal length column, using the select method, I'll show you how to do it. Again, since the select method is a part of the deploy library, if you have to work with that, your first task needs to be to load the deploy library itself. So now what I want to do is first, I'll start off by giving the name of the data frame, which is Iris. After that, I will give in this operator, which is called as the pipe operator. And now this pipe operator is, you can just consider this to be sort of a connector. So if you look at a real life scenario, what is a pipe basically used for? A pipe is used to connect different things, isn't it? So let's say on the, you have a source and you have a destination and the pipe connects the source and the destination. So that is what this pipe operator does over here. 
you have something on the left hand side and you have something on the right hand side and this symbol which you see helps connect whatever is there on the left hand side with whatever is there on the right hand side. So first I've started off by giving the name of the data frame over here which is iris then I've given the pipe operator. Now from this iris data frame I would want to select only the first column. So here I shall write down select and inside this I will give in the name of the first column. So the name of the first column is sepal length. Let me write down sepal length over here and the result which I will get I shall store that and let's say a new column or a new object called as iris sl. Now I've executed this. Let me have a glance at iris sl. So view of iris sl and you will see that from this original data frame which is iris I have been able to extract only the first column which is the sepal length column. Similarly from this entire data frame if I'd want to extract only maybe the third column over here or maybe the fourth column over here which is petal length it will sort of be a similar command first need to give in the name of the data frame which is iris then I shall give in this pipe operator following which I will use this select method and inside the select method I will give in the name of the column so the name of the column would be petal dot width and whatever result I'll get I'll go ahead and store this in a new object so let's say I call this object as iris underscore pw and I'll have a glance at this view of iris underscore pw and this is what I get so again from this original data frame where I had these five columns I have extracted only one column which is the petal width column so till now we are extracting only one single column but instead of one column let's say if I'd want to extract multiple columns that is also something which can be done and now let's say if I'd want to extract the first column third column and the fifth column what I will do over here is first again I will give in the name of the data frame which is iris then I shall use the pipe operator over here after that again I will give in the select method inside the select method I will just give in the names of all of the columns that I'd want to extract so I would want sepal length then I would want petal length let me also write down petal length over here and then finally I would need the species column so I've also written down species and I shall go ahead and store this in a new object let me call this as iris 3 call now view of iris 3 call and this is what I get so I have three columns over here sepal length petal length and species now till now whenever we were working with the sepal length we were actually giving in the names of the columns but instead of the names of the columns let's say if I uh, want to extract them using the column number that is also something which can be done so again let me just write down iris over here then I shall give in the pipe operator then going ahead again I shall use the select method now let's say if I want to extract the second column all I have to do over here is given the number 2 and I will go ahead and store this in a new object I'll call this as iris underscore 2 again view of iris underscore 2 and as you see so let me again open up or run this command again so this was my original data frame iris and from this original data frame I have been able to extract only the sepal width column similarly if I want to extract multiple columns from this data frame that is also something which can be done so now I would want to extract the sepal width column and the petal width column together so here I will write down iris I shall given the pipe operator again I shall use the select method inside this I just need to give in 2 comma 4 and I will go ahead and store this in a new object I'll call it as iris 2 4 view of iris 2 underscore 4 and this is the result 
So as you see, this was our original data frame and from our original data frame, I have successfully extracted only the sepal width column and the petal width column. Now, there could be many scenarios where let's say some columns are similar or some columns would start with a particular phrase or a particular letter. So similarly, let's say from this entire IRS data frame, if I'd want to extract all the columns where the column name starts with an S. So that is something which I can do with the help of the same select method. First, I will give an iris, then I shall use the pipe operator. Again, I'll use select and inside this, what I need to do is I have a parameter or an attribute over here and that attribute starts with is what I'll use. So the parameter over here starts with and inside this I just need to give in the name of the column or basically the starting letter over here. So here the starting letter is S. So what I'd want to do is from this entire data frame I'd want to extract all those columns where the column name starts with a capital S. And I shall go ahead and store this in a new column and a new object and I'll call that object as iris underscore s view of iris underscore s and as you see this was our original data frame where we had all of these different columns and from these different columns I have extracted sepal length, sepal width and species as these are the only three columns where the column name starts with an s. The other two columns were petal length and petal width and since the name of the column starts with a p those are something which we did not extract. So similarly, let's say if we do want to extract only petal length and petal width, that is also something which we can do. Here, I'll give an iris. And after that, again, I shall use select. Now I would want to use this starts with attribute. And here, the starting letter would be P. And now I shall store this in a new object and I shall call that new object as iris underscore p. View of iris underscore p and as you see this was my original data frame. From this original data frame I've been able to extract the petal length column and the petal width column. So this was all about the select method. Going ahead we shall work with the filter method. So the select method helped us to extract different columns. Now if I'd want to extract records on the basis of a particular condition, in that case I can use the filter method. So we have this iris data frame over here and from this iris data frame, let's say if I'd want to extract all those records where the sepal length value is greater than 5, then for that purpose I can use the filter method. So I'll show you guys an example. Again, first given the name of the data frame, after that use this pipe operator, then type in filter. So this is a method or a function which is part of your deploy library. So iris, pipe operator, filter and inside this you shall give in the condition. So what is the condition over here? Sepal length has to be greater than 5. And this I will store again in let's say iris sl5. Let me open this up. Iris sl5. Now, if you look at the sepal length column over here, you shall see that all the values in this particular column are greater than 5. And why is that? Because we have used the filter method and with the help of this filter method, we have extracted or filtered out only those records where the value of sepal length is greater than 5. Similarly, we have this sepal width column over here. Now, from this sepal width column, if I want to extract all those records, where the sepal width value is greater than 4, that is also something which we can do. So again, I'll write a similar command over here, iris, then the pipe operator. After that, I shall give in filter. And inside filter, the condition would be sepal width is greater than 4. And this I shall go ahead and store in iris sw4. Let me have a glance at this view of iris as w4 and as you see this was our original data frame. From this we have extracted only three records which would mean that out of the 150 records so as you see this iris data frame has 150 records. 
from those 150 records there are only three records present where the sepal width value is greater than four and also if you look at the species column you will see that all of those three species belong to setosa so these are the sort of interesting inferences you can make when you are performing different data mining or data manipulation operations so till now we have been using only one condition to extract records now it's not necessary that we have to use only one condition we can actually use multiple conditions to extract those records so let's say if my condition is the sepal length has to be greater than five and the species has to be let's say so we've got three species setosa versicolor and virginica so let's say the species is equal to virginica let's see if you can do that so here i shall write down iris i'll given the pipe operator then i will given the filter method inside the filter method i need to give in the first condition so the first condition is sepal dot length is greater than five after that i need to give in the second condition so before the second condition i'll give in the and operator so with the help of the and operator i'm combining these two conditions first condition sepal length greater than five and second condition needs to be i would want the species to be equal to virginica and i will store this in iris sl let me also write the spelling of virginica properly over here and i'll write virginica let me open this up iris underscore sl underscore virginica so it seems that you know we have got a data frame where there are no records present this basically means that this condition or the set of conditions which we have given no record satisfies us that is there is absolutely no virginica species present whose sepal length is greater than five and now let me change this condition a bit so let's say if I'd want all those records where sepal length is greater than phi and species is actually equal to setosa. Let me store this in iris sl underscore setosa. Let me have a glance at this view of iris sl underscore setosa. Now again we've got nil. So here it seems that the S is actually small. So whenever you are giving these conditions, you'd have to make sure that the proper nomenclature, when I say nomenclature, basically your type casing, whether it's in small case or whether it's in capital case, that you'd have to make sure is proper. And now let me make those changes. So the first condition, sepal and greater than five and species is equal to setosa. And now I'll hit enter view of iris underscore sl underscore setosa still the answer is no so here seems like the, we have uh, made a mistake over here let me write this properly so species is double equal to setosa now let me execute this and we have got the result so as you see we have this original data frame which is iris from this original iris data frame we have extracted only those records where the sepal length is greater than five and also the species is equal to setosa so we have given two conditions and we have got only those records where both of these conditions have evaluated to true similarly now let's say if i do want to give in so we've got three species again so the third species was versi color let me store this in iris sl versi color let me hit enter and let me have a glance at this view of iris underscore sl underscore versi color and here so as you see we've got 47 entries so there are total 50 species of versi color in this data frame out of those 50 species it would seem that 47 of those have a sepal length which is greater than 5 but when it came to the setosa species you have only 22 entries hmm, this is quite an interesting observation isn't it now 
similarly let me again check it with the virginica species let me make sure that the type casing is proper i'll write down virginica over here iris sl virginica let me run this i'll have a glance at this view of iris sl virginica and now you see we've got 49 entries so again there are total 50 entries of virginica out of those 50 entries 49 of them here you shall see that the sepal length is greater than 5. so this is quite an interesting observation isn't it so this was the filter method now we'll go ahead and work with the mutate method now with the help of mutate method we can modify the existing data frame or basically add some new columns into this data frame so now for that let me actually make a copy of this data frame so i'll make a copy of this and i'll just call this as iris copy let me open this up view of iris copy so from this original data frame i've just made a new copy out of this now from this copy what i'd want to do is i'd want to add a new column so if I'd want to add a new column, I would need to do that on the basis of some condition or some criteria, isn't it? So the criteria is this. I've got the sepal length column and the sepal width column. Now what I'd want to do is, I'd want a new column called as sepal total. And that sepal total is basically the addition of sepal length plus sepal width. So here is how we are going to do it. I'll write down iris. Then I'll give in the pipe operator. And then after that, let me type in mutate. So with the help of the mutate method, I just need to give him the condition over here. And now I'll get a new column, isn't it? So I need to give a name to that column. So I am writing the name of that column as sepal dot total. And in sepal dot total, this is basically the combination of sepal length plus sepal width. And I shall go ahead and store this. Well, I would basically want to store this in the same data frame. So also, I would want to make these changes in the iris copy data frame, not the original data frame. So here, iris copy. And after running this command, you shall see that I have added a new column over here, which is sepal total. And when you combine these to 5.1 plus 3.5, what you get is 8.6. Similarly, 4.9 plus 3.0, you get 7.9. 4.7 plus 3.2, what you get is 7.9. So this is how we have used the mutate method to add the values which are present in these two columns. Similarly, I'd want to add another column which is called as the petal total, which is a combination of your petal length and petal width. Now I'll write down iris. Let me use the pipe operator over here. I'll again use the mutate method. I'll give in the name of the new column. So the name of the new column will be petal dot total. And this petal dot total is basically petal length plus petal width. And I again, I would want to make these changes to the iris copy data frame again. I shall store this back in iris copy as well. So here, as you see, I have again added a new column called as petal total. Now, if you add these to 1.4 plus 0.2, what you get is 1.6. Similarly, over here, 1.5 plus 0.2 is 1.7. Here, if we take this 1.7 plus 0.4, this is 2.1. So this is how we have used the mutate method to again add two columns and make a new column. Now, let's do some visualization. And for the purpose of visualization, we have a library called as ggplot2. So again, if you would have to work with any library, I'd want to load it. So I'll write down library inside this. I will give in the name of the library, which is ggplot2. Now, after loading this, I'll be performing these operations on a data set called as diamonds. And that diamonds data set is part of this ggplot2 package. Let me write down view and inside this I shall give in the name of the data frame which is diamonds. Now I have all of these different columns over here and if I'd want information about this I can just put in a question mark and given the name of the data frame which is diamonds and as you see I've got the entire information over here. 
So this data frame is basically a data set containing the prices and other attributes of almost 54,000 diamonds. And these are the different variables. So we've got this price column over here, which is price in US dollars. And the price varies from $326 to $18,000. Then we've got this uh, carrot column over here, and this would tell us about the weight of the diamond. Then we've got the cut. So here, this would tell us the quality of the cut, which could be fair, good, very good, premium, and ideal. Going ahead, we've got the color over here. Again, this would tell us the diamond color from D to J, D being the best and J being the worst. So like this, you can find out the information about all of the columns which you have over here. Now, what I'd want to do is, I would want to make a histogram for this price column. And you'd have to understand that whenever you are working with a histogram, you are normally using a histogram to understand the distribution of a continuous numerical value. So here this price is obviously a continuous numerical value and that is why I'll be using a histogram. And for that purpose, I would need to work with the ggplot2 library. I have already loaded this library and this ggplot2, it is based on something known as grammar of graphics. So whenever you're learning a new language, every language has a set of grammatical instructions, isn't it? And grammar is what forms the base of any language. Similarly, if you look at visualization, you can also consider visualization to be a form of language. And since visualization is a language, it will also have some sort of grammatical instructions. So this ggplot2 library is based on those grammatical instructions. So you can consider that there are different layers in ggplot2. So the first layer is the data layer. After that, we have something known as the aesthetics layer. And on the aesthetics layer, we basically map our different parameters onto the different aesthetics or different columns onto the different aesthetics. Then we have something called as the geometry layer. So when you're making different graphs, you can make a scatter plot, bar plot, histogram, line plot, area plot, and so on. So all of these are considered as different geometries. So what Grammar of Graphics states is, you start off with the data layer, and on top of the data layer, you stack different layers on top of it. So at the bottom, you have the data layer. Above that, you keep the aesthetic layer. Above that, you keep the geometry layer. So for now, in this session, we'll look at only these three layers. And if we'd have to add anything else, we'll look at them later on. So now, since I'd want to make a histogram for this particular column, I'd have to start off by writing ggplot. So ggplot is obviously part of ggplot2 library. And I am starting off by setting the data layer. So data is equal to diamonds. This would mean that I am mapping this diamonds data set onto the data layer or this diamonds data frame onto the data layer. After that, I will have the aesthetic layer. So all of these different columns which you see, I can map those columns onto a particular aesthetic. So let's say if I have to map something onto the x-axis or onto the y-axis here, these are your aesthetics. So now what I'm doing is I am mapping the price column onto the x aesthetic, which would basically mean that I am mapping the price column onto the x-axis. So here I shall write down x is equal to price. And now I shall run this. So when I execute this, you shall see that on the X axis, I have the price column. And here, obviously the price starts from zero goes on till greater than $15,000. And now I have the data layer, which is this diamonds. And on top of that, I've also mapped the price layer. Now I would want to stack another layer on top of this, which is the geometry layer. And since I'd want to make a histogram, what I'd want to do is I'll use this plus symbol and I have these different geometry layers over here. So from all of these different geometry layers, what I'd want is the geom histogram because I'd want to make a histogram. Now I've selected geom histogram and I'll just click on enter. And as you see, I have successfully created this histogram over here. Let me also zoom this for you folks. And as you see, 
This is our histogram and on the x-axis, the price over here ranges from zero to greater than $18,000 obviously. And if you look at this particular graph, it is sort of clear that most of the diamonds, their price range would be between zero to $5,000. And there are very few diamonds whose price range would be greater than $5,000. Now, this plot seems a bit bland, doesn't it? So what I'd want to do is I'd want to add some color to this plot. So there are two types of colors. Since this is basically an entire area, I can add a boundary color to this and I can add a fill color to this. So I have the same command over here inside this. I'll add a parameter called as fill and inside fill I'll probably give a color. Let's say I given the orange color and as you see I have filled this histogram with this orange color and now I can also give a boundary color. So for the boundary color I have another parameter called as call and I shall give the boundary color as red. Now. When I run this, you shall see that I have also added a boundary color over here. So this is how what I can do is I can add a fill color to this and also add a, a boundary color to this. Going ahead, I want to similarly understand the distribution of a categorical column. I've got this column which is cut. So cut is a categorical column because I have all of these different categories over here. So you have to understand that whenever you want to understand the distribution of a numerical column, you use a histogram. And whenever you want to understand the distribution of a categorical column, you use a bar plot. So if I want to visualize this, I will make a bar plot. Now I'll again write down a GG plot. I'll use data and for the data layer, I will map the cut column. Going ahead, what I would want to do is I'll use the aesthetic layer. And on to the X axis, this time I will map the cut column and going ahead, I need to use a geometry. Since I'd want to make a bar plot, I'll select geom bar and let me hit enter over here. So it seems like I've got an error over here. You're passing a function as global data. Have you misspelled data argument? So I've made a Little mistake over here. So data is basically a diamond. So let me write that down properly. From this diamonds data frame, I am mapping this cut column onto the X aesthetic and I want to make a bar plot. And as you see, this is the beautiful bar plot which we get. So I've got all of these different categories and it would seem that most of the diamonds which I have in this data frame, they belong to the ideal category. And there are very few diamonds, probably around even less than 1000 or even less than 500, which are of fair type. Now what I'd want to do is again, if I'd want to add color to these bars, that is something which I can do. I'll add fill color and also add a boundary color. To add a fill color, I'll just write down fill and let's say I'd want to give them a green color. So I've given them a green color and let me also give them a boundary color. So for the boundary color, I'll write down call and let me just give them a black color. And as you see, I have given them a, a black color over here. So folks, this is it for this R programming tutorial. And in this we have comprehensively learned about the fundamentals of R programming. Then we've learned about the different data structures in R. Going ahead, we have also worked with two libraries, which are Diplio and ggplot2. So, Thank you very much and I'll sign off over here. Now before you guys leave, I'll request you guys to please like the video and also hit the subscribe button and thank you very much guys.